Okay, we're about to start the Jordan Grand Rounds. We'll be ready in just a second. This is Dr. John Bennett from Miami. We're setting up for this multidisciplinary presentation of uh, tuberous sclerosis in a family of three people. Uh, I'm coordinating activities from Miami for Jordan. As you can see, they're just setting up. Let me get off my smartphone here. I'm in there. Uh, good morning to you all. My name is Abraham Sreh, and we are transmitting live here from Amman, Jordan, at the Farah Medical Campus. And the, the backdrop is the Dead Sea, which is the lowest point on Earth, where you can just float on the surface of water. Uh, we are presenting a tuberous sclerosis case, where we will combine and correlate the clinical, radiological, operative, and pathological findings. Tuberous sclerosis, which is a disease, a complex disease, was first described by von Bicklenhausen. You know von Bicklenhausen of the neurofibromatosis back 1862, and Bonville followed 1880. These were the first description of this disease. This is von Bicklenhausen. He is a German pathologist, and he just noticed a fetus who was just born, who died later, within a few minutes, and he examined him and he found that he has brain tumors and uh, other tumors. So he coined uh, that uh, name. Followed by this uh, French man, a uh, French neurologist, 1880, he had an epileptic patient who eventually died with the status epilepticus, and he did post-mortem, and he found that she has a brain tumor. And then this man, uh, Bogit, a German neurologist, 1908, who gave the classical triad to this disease. Patients would have epilepsy, mental retardation, and they have something on their face called the denoma sedation. Uh, so this is the first description of the triads. And this disease occurred in one in 10,000 live births. It is autosomal dominant genetic disorder. Either the father or the mother will be carrying the disease and they will transmit it to half of their children, boys or girls. <coughs> Just to say that around the world, there's something like two to five million people in the world with tuberous sclerosis. What is the pathology? What is the cause of this disease? It's a genetic problem. So we have two genes, genes that are responsible for normal functioning of the cell. These genes, they have a mutation, and this mutation will lead, without going into much details, this is certain pathway that will lead to eventually the cell growth and division. This pathway 
is freed and therefore lots of cells are formed as a tumor. So these genes act as tumor suppressor and when they are mutated, they are gone, tumors would develop. These chromosomes are chromosome 9 and 16. Each one of them is responsible for certain protein formation. This absence of genes lead to the activation of the pathway, which I just mentioned, leading to pro proliferation and formation of tumors or hamartomas. So what will this result in? This will result in some derangement of the, uh, the cortex, cerebral cortex during fetal life. This is normal cerebral cortex of mine and yours, made of six layers, well organized here, disarray of these layers, they are disorganized. There's no good cerebral cortex. This is normal cerebral cortex, certain arrangements. This is not arranged. This is deranged, disorganized. And if you look into these cortices, you will find abnormal cells that they are not normally there. The small thick neurons, balloon cells, these are not normally in the cortex. So that would lead to formation of something called tubers, tubers like masses or uh, sclerosis. This could be in the cortex or just underneath the cortex or in the white matter. And they occur in 90 to 100 percent of patients with this disease. What do I mean by tubers? Look at this. These are called tubers in the cortex. Look at this, tubers in the cortex. Again, all these denotes either cortical or subcortical or even white matter tubers. Again here. And this may calcify. The second thing that can happen is that underneath the ependema, there will be some nodules. We call them subependymal nodules, S-E-N, subependymal nodules. Again, they occur in 90 to 100 percent of patients with tuberous sclerosis. Look at these tubules, nodules. Here they are. Why do they occur in this area? It is unclear why they are inside the ventricle, under the ependema, and surrounding the foramen of Monroe. So people thought about it. Uh, this is the putamen. We are from lateral to medial putamen, and then we have the other areas of the uh, uh, basal ganglia, and then we have the thalamus. So putamen and globus validus, then thalamus, and then we have the the Codate nucleus. So codate nucleus has a head, body, and the tail. Head, body, and the tail. It seems that the tumors, they organize themselves around the codate nucleus. So if you look at the MRI or CT, you will find that you will see the codate nucleus in all the cuts. Amazingly, that these lesions occur along the codate nucleus. Somebody thought about this. And this paper, a very interesting paper from New York, they found that these really tumors raise themselves around the codate nucleus, mostly around foramen of Mondo. Again here, look, exactly where the codate nucleus is. There you are. Nodules underneath the ependema, they may calcify, but just the concentrating around the foramen of Monroe. Any other location? <coughs> the actual loss of this? Uh, yes, we'll, we'll come to that, yes. So this is a picture that says it all. The cortical, subcortical nodules, the subependable mm -hmm. nodules, and the so-called migration line. So this simplifies exactly what we will see in these diseases. As I said, they may calcify like this. And then it's important to know what's the differential diagnosis of this calcification. The third thing that happened, so we spoke about the 
cortical, subcortical nodules. We spoke about the subependymal nodules. And from these subependymal nodules may develop SIGA. SIGA, abbreviation of subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, a very special type of tumors that happens only in tuberous sclerosis. So they develop from these subependymal nodules. Do, do they occur in all patients? No, just about 5 to 20 percent of patients, and we see them around this age. So SIGA, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, is a benign tumor. It's a WHO grade one tumor. And as you can see here, CT scan appearances. Look at this here. The whole disease, the cortical lesions, the subependymal lesions, the white matter disease. And this is the MRI T1, T1 with contrast. They take contrast very well because they are very vascular. And this is the flare again showing these lesions. So flare showing you the lesions. The whole story is there. Different types of uh, series. This is my series. And they can progress. So this is a paper which describes this progression of the disease, how they progress slowly by time. All of them, they grow at a different pace. So they could be giant like this, they could be smaller, but notice that they are centered around foramen of model. So the main presentation is blockage of CSF and hydrocephalus. And this is the calcification that you may see on MRI. They can bleed. So this is a tumor, which is vascular, that can present with acute hemorrhage. And remember, we presented here the uh, pituitary apoplexy. So one would think of pituitary apoplexy in these cases. What is the role of PET scan? This is the cortical tubules, and this is the PET scan showing it has decreased activity. So PET scan has a role also. LDG bit in particular, you can see hypometabolism in that area. And when you combine both, you can put this on this and come out with this. So this will define to you where is the uh, lesion. Again, area of hypometabolism and the FDG PET here, which is corresponding to this, here it is there. And when you put them together, you find this picture. Uh, not only that, you see the lesion better, but our neurologists are all here today. Tuberous sclerosis present with epilepsy, and then you treat them with medication, usually they are resistant, so you may go for surgery for epilepsy. Which one of these you want to remove? Which one is the epileptogenic area? So this FDG PET would help you because there is this area of hypometabolism which is not corresponding to the size of this. So it is considered as the culprit and the surgery there may help these patients. Again, the same thing here, hypometabolism. So you may think that this is the culprit for epilepsy as a hocus. Difference, we use MRI is normal, but the PET shows this hypometabolism. And you can tell that this is the legion and then you can put the <coughs> subdural grids and treat it surgically. SPECT, another type of modality, whereby you can see it as hyperbetabolism, hyperperfusion actually, it is uh, dealing with the, how much blood there is. So it can show you the lesion. There it is on MRI, there it is on the SPECT, and then you fuse them together. Here's the MRI, here's the SPECT, which is used, and you can see the region and the hypometabolic area. So FDG bet is useful in these cases, not for diagnosis only, but for defining the epileptogenic focus. Any other manifestations one one for the disease? Yes, ophthalmological, and it happens in half of the patients. 
they are either retinal hematomas or flat or nodular and depigmentation. These are retinal hematomas. Our ophthalmologist here would appreciate these lesions. Different types of hematomas. They come either or, or they come. Fifty percent of patients may develop these. Fifty percent have these ophthalmological uh, changes. So again, this paper, very interesting paper about the OCT in these hematomas. So this is a hematoma, and this is the OCT, and you can see the lesion. Same here, here because it's big, it's coming up like this. So OCT is important in this regard. Any other manifestations? Yes. Let me just have some water. <coughs> I had a heavy breakfast this morning. <coughs> so dermatological, and this is important, 90% of patients, 90%. And you start with children. So this is why we invited our colleagues, the pediatricians, because it's their duty to discover these cases. And our pediatric neurologist and other neurologists are here. And the general practitioners are of great importance to diagnose this disease. These lesions are disfiguring, distressful, and painful for those kids. So this is a very important thing. Cutaneous manifestation of tuberous sclerosis and the pediatrician and the general practitioner role. This is the main presentation. Adenoma situation. It is not adenoma situation. Zayil acne vulgaris. It is actual angiofibromas. Lots of blood vessels in it. It's red papules containing blood vessels. Once you do this, this is 90% tuberous sclerosis. Different kinds of it. It can be very severe. But the diagnosis is there. And something else is these spots, white spots that looks like these leaves. And that's why it's called ash leaf spots, hypopigmentation. They have this flat, uh, like the orange peel on the skin, big areas like this, called chagrin uh, uh, patch. They have this gingival fibroma, look at this and the distorted teeth, fibroma. <coughs> they have these plaques on the face, it's called face plaques. They have this, very unusual. How many of us examine the nails and the toes of your patients? Very few, but you see these. And the toes or in the, on the fingers, but mostly in the toes, you clench the diagnosis. So 90% of your patients with tuberculosis have these skin manifestations. They can come up with cardiac manifestations, cardiac rhabdomyomas, large ones. These are pictures, giant fetal rhabdomyoma, left ventricle and multiple. <coughs> they can also go to the, to the lungs and they present with the lamb. Lamb is lymphangio. Leomyosarcoma, like this, like this, like this. Again, lamb, pulmonary leomyosarcoma. They can affect the kidneys. Kidneys are the most important ones that are affected usually. <coughs> 50 to 80% of patients. And they come also with the tumors, angiolipomas, or polycystic kidney disease. And some people thought, why polycystic kidney disease? They have polycystic disease also as a genetic disease. What is the relation? Because the chromosomes are close together, so they can uh, dentate each other. So either angiomyolipoma, or polycystic kidney, or renal cell carcinoma. Here you are. Could be unilateral, could be bilateral tumors of the kidneys, renal cysts, polycystic disease of the kidneys, or you come up with renal carcinoma. 
So tuberous sclerosis is tuberous sclerosis complex because it affects so many systems in the body, including the brain. It can also affect the liver with either cysts or with the tumors and the lipomas. So what's the clinical picture? We described it almost, but mostly these three lines. Developmental delay, a child who is not developing well at school, maybe they present with autism, and definitely with epilepsy. So how to find a definite diagnosis? You need to find two major features or two major with one uh, minor. The major ones which I described, the facial thing, facial angiofibroma, the subangual fibroma, the chagrin patch, any of these considered as a primary uh, criteria. After these, if you find something in the brain like tubers or subependymenodules and anything else, then you will uh, clinch the diagnosis. In the secondary features, you need two of these, plus one of the primary, anything in the kidneys like polycystic kidney or pulmonary or cardiac. And of course, you will get the genetic testing and you have to assess your patients from the neuropsychological point of view. We invited Dr. Ulit Sarhan, is he around? No. no. You are here, okay, thank you. So we'll come back to you. So what is the treatment of these? Treatment options of SIGA. SIGA because it's the tumor that develops in these patients. If you find calcification, you will leave it. Mental retardation, you will treat the aspects of it. Epilepsy, you will treat it with anti-epileptic drugs. But what about these tumors? The SIGA, sub giant astrocytoma. Surgery is the standard. I will come to new pharmacotherapy. I'll come to the radiation therapy and the stereotactic radiation. So surgery, in addition to surgery, you have endoscopic surgery, either open surgery or endoscopic surgery, just the same. Radiotherapy, in, in a nutshell, outcomes are very disappointing. These humans are not radio resistant. Simple as that. So people came up with another radiation, laser interstitial thermal therapy, LED. It is MRI guided. It's said that it destroys the tissues by using heat. Whether that is correct or not, we don't know. But there are papers which say something. This is one of the papers saying that this is the lesion before treatment and this is after treatment. So they claim they were successful. Another case, they got the tumor reduced in size. Laser interstitial thermal therapy. Some people use gamma knife very, very uh, unsuccessful. And there is uncertainty in efficacy and there is nothing. The major uh, center in, the, in America is in Pittsburgh, the major center in Europe is in Sweden. And this is in Pittsburgh, over 20 years, they have just treated uh, five patients or six patients. <coughs> now this is the medical treatment. Remember we said about this pathway? This is the normal pathway that allows the cell to function and to divide. If you do mutation, and the genes are done, and this is free to divide so much, so you'll have it humans. So if you give a drug that will stop and inhibit this pathway, then you may get uh, the tumor less. So this is the drug, Evrolimus and Tismolimus. They are FDA approved in the States and in Europe. It's an oral drug three milligram per square meter per day, and then you try to titrate the concentration. The problem is that you have to continue this medication all life, and there are so, lots of uh, side effects. Do you for anti-rejection purposes as well? Sorry? Anti-rejection medications as well? Uh, I don't know about other uses, but they are used as such for this uh, uh, pathway. Yes, as, as anti-cancer. Mm -hmm. So there are some papers which describe this. Uh, medical treatment. Uh, this is the uh, subrendimal use that developed into the SIGA, the tumor, subrendimal giant astrocytoma, and they have given it the, this medication, and it seems to be less. Another case, getting less. This is three months, this is 36 months. Stop the medication, the tumor will grow back. Another series with this tumor being treated. So how, how successful is this? I don't know. But as I said, the main thing that you have to continue with it, 
Please stop with the tumor and we'll come back. Now we'll come to our case presentation related to the subject. This is an 18 year old uh, girl, female. She's Palestinian residing in uh, Saudi Arabia. Very unlucky. Uh, she came to us last year with headaches, nausea, vomiting, and blurring vision. These three were the young residents increased in technique pressure. She had also imbalance and she had seizures. So, major problem. What about past history? Oh, yes, she was epileptic since she was at the age of two. Epilepsy started at the age of two. Nobody put the answer to why she would have epilepsy. Anyway, this is her vital signs on arrival to Jordan, end of last year. Nothing unusual in her general examination. Plus, on scale, good. She had cerebellar signs, with imbalance. Her gait was unsteady. Uh, no weaknesses in her upper and lower limbs. The only thing in her lab is just a little bit related to white BCs. Other than that, everything was normal. So at that time, we looked into her images. Let's see the images that she had at the age of two, when she has seizures and she was put on tegretur. There they are, normal. But having a normal CT or MRI doesn't mean the end of the story. So nothing in the MRI of 2002 in Saudi Arabia. We also requested other images. So I said, yes, at the age of seven years, she had also seizures and she had another MRI. But all the time she had poor school performance, epilepsy, mental retardation. They should have thought of tuberous sclerosis. They didn't. That's how it is. So these are total, there is a tumor, there is a lesion there. So it's, you know, just one plus one equals two. This should clench the diagnosis. They didn't. So this 2017. Then uh, repeatedly having uh, uh, epilepsy. So in Saudi Arabia, she had also this MRI, which showed that the lesion is bigger, much bigger. No red flags, no bells ringing. They are in deep sleep. So she came to us in November 2017. Skull X-ray tells you the diagnosis. This is so-called silver beating appearance. This is a chronic increased intracranial pressure. The convolutions of the brain are hitting against the skull and because these changes. Chest X-ray was with the normal, some infiltration there. But look at this, large tumor obstructing the thyroid of marble and the huge hydrocephalus. So this is the MRI of November 2017, which I showed you the essence of it. The uh, MRA just showing in the lateral view, the arching of the uh, vessels due to hydrocephalus. Again, cuts from the coronal sections of this tumor, both right and left, but this side on the left is more calcified than the others. Large part on the right, small part calcified on the left. But nevertheless, it's obstructing foramen of Mordo completely, causing severe hydrocephalus. <coughs> this is November 17. This is the sagittal view, totally obstructing the foramen of Mordo and going downwards into the third vertical. Of course, this is vein of Gaia and this is straight sinus. <coughs> The rest of the MRI. So what's the differential diagnosis when you see it? Suppose you just see the MRI. You don't know about the patient. Would you diagnose tuberous sclerosis or would you diagnose something else? Let's see. Pendymoma, of course. This is intraventricular tumor. And the commonest intraventricular tumor is ependymoma. And look at this. It looks very much like our case, this particular. So ependymoma, why not? 
Sub Ibn Dimama, another thing, Ibn Dimama, Sub Ibn Dimama, Sub Ibn Dimal Giant Associator, three different cells, Sub Ibn Dimama, inside the ventricle. Of course, the, the topic of today is the Sub Ibn Dimal Giant Astrocytoma. Astrocytoma is in general, not Sub Ibn Dimal, but Astrocytoma grade one, grade two, three, four. Astrocytomas of different grades can present into the ventricle. A glioblastoma multiform, a JBM, also can be inside the ventricle. Oligodendroglioma, another astrocytoma, uh, another glioma can also develop in that area. These are all my cases. Neurocytoma, I have a big collection of these intraventricular tumors, and this is one of the largest intraventricular tumors. Neurocytoma, Look, again, they love this area, they love the area of the foramen of Monroe. Foramen of Monroe is uh, very dearly beloved for one reason. Maybe people think it's a female. <laughs> Coronal plexus lesions, whether it is papilloma, atypical papilloma, or even carcinoma, the three types of coronal plexus tumors. <coughs> Germinoma, this is one of my cases, and this is like a girl. Peanut, primary neuroectodermal tumor. Very much like our case. Colloid cyst, for one of the Again, one of the commonest lesions. Again, this is one of the largest colloid cyst in literature, one of mine from Yemen. Intraventricular teratoma. Oh, intraventricular teratoma and subventricular, yes, they can happen. That's what I'm saying always that if you just think of one or two pathologies, you are lost. You are lost as a human being and as a doctor. Angular neuroblastoma. Giant aneurysm. Imagine this as a giant aneurysm. Yes, why not? Giant aneurysm of the internal carotid and its branches. You open it, you are done, patient is done. Intraventricular meningioma. There is category of intraventricular meningioma. So, Meningioma occur from the dura arachnoid, we say no. Meningioma arise from the arachnoid, whether it is around or inside the ventricle, because there is arachnoid inside the ventricle, the so-called choroid plexus. So this intraventricular tumor can occur in anywhere, but especially in the left atrium of the lateral ventricle, very rarely at the foramen of Monroe, but this is one of my cases. Metastasis, again, Metastasis inside the ventricle, metastasis in the ventricle, yes. Metastasis, they are uh, choosy, they go wherever they want. Corbus callosum lipoma. Intracranial tuberculoma, intra ventricular tuberculoma, especially in Yemeni patients, Sudanese. Neurocystosarcosis, Montasar is not here, but he would have loved this to see this. This is a neurocystic sarcosis. Why not? Again, because you don't read and you come to just this small piece of knowledge and you continue all your life with this small piece of knowledge. Oh, this is gastritis, this is appendicitis, this kind of itis thing, and then you're lost. Lymphoma. Would you believe this? This is a lymphoma in this Iraq, in this Syrian patient. And look at the lymphoma here, very much like the subdural nodules. They love the ventricle. And I have a few of these cases over the last maybe year. Myself and Allah Adasi, we had seven patients of intracranial lymphoma, uh, lymphomas. Now calcification, we said these lesions calcify. So what is the differential diagnosis of this calcification? There is something called normal physiological calcification that we see in the basal ganglia. This is normal. But there are calcification related to hyperparathyroidism. <laughs> this is pathological calcification. Calcification related to influenza, to malaria, to HIV, to toxoplasmosis. That's why they produce this term TORSH, toxoplasma, and so on and so forth to describe the uh, group of diseases that cause this calcification. This is calcification for one reason, it is there. So 
without this patient in, as we are investigating, hello, hello, patient is unconscious, fix dilated pupils. I went there to the room, indeed she was flat, unconscious, and her right pupil was fixed, dilated. So we well, knew this is due to hydrocephalus, and then took her to the theater, and I put external ventricular drain. I did not put the shunt. Shunt is a disease in itself, and it is used by the mediocre surgeons to solve their problems. Anything is treated with shunt. A good shunt is no shunt. Everybody says this, but in the third world countries, shunt is what the mediocre surgeons have in their hands. They treat everything with the shunt. What's the difference between external and external? So it's temporary. You put it into the venture, you bring the yourself out. You save the patient life. Shunt is inside shunt. It stays. If I have a, a boy or a girl with hydrocephalus, I would not love you to put the shunt in them because they would live a miserable life. So, that's the extent of ventricular drain. And for the nurses here, we will give you some lectures about how to handle this because this is, can cause the patient to lose her life or her life if it is not handled properly. This is a drain for the ventricle. It, you don't put it on the floor. You don't put it with the gravity because you do this, all of the CSF will go to the drain and patient would die. Did we have death due to external ventricular drain in Jordan? So many. So many. The arrest happened because of coning, you think? Yes. The CSF goes, the ventricles collapse, the brain collapse, hemorrhage, death. What do you don't do with the tibia? That, that, would, that wouldn't do. If you do lumbar puncture in these cases, they would die out of that nature. In fact, it is completely contraindication. So, of course, we put the drain, here it is, frontal. So we drain CSF, we save the patient's life. She recovered immediately, on table, her pupil started to rest. This is a crime. This is a crime. Bilateral shunt to treat this tumor. You know, the criminal surgeon has no idea how to operate. So he resorted to what he knows, the shunt, to what he was trained for, shunt. And I always say, you ask somebody, give me your logbook of surgery. Oh, I have done 300 cases. Let me see. 299 are shunts and revisions of shunts. And this man, woman, will be certified as a neurosurgeon and he will be free to kill patients. So we did a few consultations. Uh, we asked Dr. Reed, Sarhan and his team, would you like to comment? Or should I? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Ala. Ala. Ala Bishtawi. She is a psychologist with Dr. Uh, Sarhan. Why did we ask Dr. Reed? We asked them in most of the cases of brain tumors. This is the standard in any good unit that they should have psychological analysis, especially in tuberous sclerosis where they have mental retardation. So we asked them to do Karnofsky performance scale, KPS, which is very important. And it's 50, it's very low. This is critical because this patient is going to take care of herself after surgery. Her IQ was very low, 60. So this is important to assess the patient before uh, surgery. Uh, so I always put what has been written so that if anybody denies, I say, here it is. We ask Dr. Ibrahim Sadat, is he around? Yes, sir. Good morning. So as you saw in the images, there's a lesion that is causing increased intracranial pressure. And with this, we expect if it is a long standing thing, we expect uh, a pelidema. So uh, that was the case. Uh, and in a lot of cases of pelidema, the vision is not affected until late in the disease. So the vision is still good 0.8 in the right, one in the left. If the disease is equal, there will be no differences in the pupillary uh, response. So, so there is no afferent pupillary defect. And obviously, if uh, the fundoscopy shows uh, bilateral optic disc swelling, 
uh, we see uh, we say optic disc swelling uh, if we don't know the cause but in obvious cases like this we are 100 percent sure that it is secondary to increased intracranial pressure so we call it papillinema motility um, is full in both uh, eyes this is not the case in many cases like this because the six and other <coughs> cranial nerves um, motor nerves are affected visual field there is non-specific changes in the visual field because uh, with papilledema, sometimes we see increased uh, or enlarged blind spot, but uh, many times we don't see a specific pattern uh, for the disease. Thank you. So this patient had hydrocephalus and papilledema, and she lost consciousness because of hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus can kill. It can maim. People take hydrocephalus easily. It's a fatal disease if it is not treated appropriately. We got the consent. The consent we have talked, spoke about it so many times. It has to be details it's specific for that particular patient, not for any patient. Uh, it does not stand in court. It does not stand in medicine. It does not stand in ethics. Which way to go? I that I would go between the two hemispheres, the so-called transcalosal, because I cross the corpus callosum like this. Or I go this way through the brain into the uh, ventricle. So transventricular or trans uh, um, depends on the many factors. I choose to do this through transcortical. So you come and put your flap just uh, in the front, a little back, two thirds in the front, one third in the back, and you open the bone here, like this one, like this one. This is the midline. We may use navigation to make sure that we are in the right spot. Again, navigation of for the beginners or training, not for me. If I don't know where I am, I should not be doing the surgery. Navigation confirms that I am in the right place, confirms. So I want to go to the foramen of Monroe. This is the lateral ventricle, interior horn, body, <coughs> atrium, occipital horn, temporal horn. From the lateral ventricle through the foramen of Monroe into the third ventricle. This is the roof, the posterior wall, the floor, the anterior wall of the third ventricle. This is the adhesions between the two thalami, mass and ED. This is the, where the pineal gland is. And this is aqueductor salvius, fourth ventricle, lateral opening of Lushka, median of Magendi, and then the spinal canal. So I want to go there. There, foramen of Monroe. There are two foramen E of Monroe. One on each side. So if I look at the ventricles from above, ventricle on the right, ventricle on the left, there is septum bilicidum or lucidum between the two. This is the caudate nucleus, and this is the thalamus, and this is called the caudate thalamic fissure, where the thalamus striate vein, thalamus striate vein, that lies. So magnified view, right ventricle, left ventricle, the septum between the two. Phenomenon of one row right, phenomenon of one row left. This is thalamus triate between the thalamus and the codate. The thalamus triate between the thalamus and the codate. Look at the codate. It's large. And the tumors would love this area. So when you come close, the septal vein, the thalamus triate vein, they join together to form the internal cerebral vein. So one is the column of the fornix. Important for memory, this, for the psychological assessment. The column of the fornix, this is the body of the fornix, is important. It's part of the limbic system. It's extremely important. People, they lose the memory completely because of surgery in this area. So this, the column of the fornix, is very important. Septal vein is very important. Most important is the thalamus red vein. Damage it, patient will have infarction, hemiplegia, and most likely will die. So we are going to operate in this critical area. That's why the mediocre surgeons go for the shunt, because they don't know this. So he knows he cannot operate in this patient. So put a shunt and send them for radiotherapy. Let's see the surgeon. Again, I went through the cortex on the right side, made an opening. I am now inside the ventricle. The minute I touch the tumor, it bleeds. 
because this confirms that it is a vascular tumor. It is a friable tumor, you see, trying to catch something to send it to Dr. Abu Farsakh at his lab. It's very friable, but very vascular at the same time. And I don't see the structures behind. I don't see the thalamus triate, I don't see the septal, I don't see the caudate. And here I discovered foramen of Monroe by just looking around. So the tumor is centered around foramen of Monroe. Again, I'm just showing you this to make the correlation because this is the theme of the lectures, the correlation between radiology and pathology. Friable tumor, vascular tumor. It is obstructing for me completely. Have you thought of embolizing it before? No, no. It's not the kind of uh, thing that needs embolization. Embolization also has its own side effects if you use it uh, not carefully. And what kind of reoccurrence for this? Of this? About 20%. So this is the foramen of Monroe. We opened the foramen of Monroe. And we make sure that there is no bleeding because the blood in the ventricle will cause hydrocephalus. That's why we take external drain and we keep it post up. Because yes, we remove the tumor and we open the foramen of Monroe, but still there is more tumor to remove. So here is uh, bipolar to remove the last piece. I don't use the bipolar on the surface of the tumor on the attachment. So that when I send this to the lab, uh, Dr. Farsaf and Dr. Anab and many others would see fresh uh, tissues. So here we are, we are looking at some blood in the ventricle, we suck it out, we keep washing, washing so that this is the choroid pixels and the choroid fissures on the right side. So here, here we are. And I want now to open the septum lucidum so that I will communicate the two ventricles. Here is the septum lucidum, and I want to open it. I open it now, so I communicate both ventricles. So if one is obstructed, the other will function. So I don't need to put two shunts like the mediocre surgeons do. I looked and there's this calcification here, which I did not remove because it is calcified. So this is the end of the, of the surgery. We keep washing, washing, because we should leave no blood in the ventricle. Blood in the ventricle causes hallucination, confusion. I think a couple of weeks ago, we've done colloid cysts, and people in the ICU have seen the patient being confused and thrashing about. Blood in the ventricle is very irritating. So, Mr. Pathology. Uh, <clears throat> this was uh, this was a really very interesting and difficult case. Uh, I didn't know all the history till now. Uh, the only thing that I received in the closing section I received this tumor. I want to show you this is the gross of the specimen. If you remember in the video of the uh, operation, we had the Ibrahim took a big piece, and this is the big piece that was taken. Uh, you can see this is postulated lobulated uh, lesion. You can see the grooves between it. Uh, this was about two centimeters. This is the biggest piece, and there are some other pieces. And this is the color of it. It's dark, dark brown. Next slide. Uh, this was uh, actually a strange tumor. Uh, I, I didn't know also that was in the form of Monroe till I reached to the diagnosis that this is Zika or subependymal gel cell astrocytoma. Uh, so it, because when once you diagnose Zika, you cannot retract from it because you are committed to call this patient tuber sclerosis. And I didn't know that actually he has tuber sclerosis till today. Uh, this is the legion. You can see that uh, uh, there are spindles of cells in fascicular pattern, goes in fascicular patterns. And they are large cells. They are large, but not giant cells. But they are, they look ugly now somehow uh, for when you start looking at them. And there are some uh, lipocytic changes in here. Uh, and probably some microcysts. Some of them are lipocytes, some of them are microcysts. And uh, giving the history, uh, next slide, giving the history, you can see this is like uh, microcystic areas. Uh, you can see granular uh, bodies. Uh, and this is unusual to see granular bodies in SIGA, uh, but giving the history, it, at least 
this has been discovered uh, uh, 10 years before the, the, uh, the operation. The granular bed this indicates that this is usually chronic, low, slow, uh, slow, low growing tumor can, can occur usually in biolocytic astrocytomas and some other slowly growing tumors like uh, uh, BTX. So this, the, uh, looking at this, um, you know that probably you are, although the cells look uh, somehow bad, and there are some mitotic figures we'll show you, uh, probably think, uh, well, this usually occur in low grade tumors, so I have really to calm down and uh, look very carefully and not to jump into malignant diagnosis. Uh, the cells, as you can see, <clears throat> very importantly, they look like ganglion-like cells. Uh, they, they are large, it looks like ganglions, and uh, with eccentric nuclei and very prominent nuclei. And uh, uh, the overall architecture will make sure that probably I'm, uh, I'm looking at a very ancient uh, tumor. That's why the cells are, have ancient uh, uh, changes and uh, so why they should look like ugly, but they are not actually ugly. Next slide. You can see areas, it's very vascular tumor, as Dr. Ibrahim pointed out, and vascular, and this is areas of hemorrhage. And this hemorrhage will uh, suddenly expand the tumor, and probably this, why the patient went into hydrocephalus or hydrocephalus suddenly, because there was a hemorrhage. Hemorrhage in these tumors will cause sudden enlargement and blocking what was not blocked. Next slide. You can see there are, I took many uh, uh, pictures of this tumor, because it's rare tumor, probably this is the second that I have seen in uh, my life. Uh, usually the, this is a tumor and this is the normal tissue and it's well delineated. This gives you very good indication that probably you are dealing with benign tumor. And these are the ganglion-like large cells, not giant cells. And these are the granular body with lipocytic changes. Lipocytic changes can be seen in long studying tumors. Usually in the literature, this is not described uh, much in SEGA. The SEGA is a rare tumor because most of the time it's operated uh, early on. But this patient has uh, this tumor for many years. Next slide. You can see again, this is slide. You can see many lipocytic changes. The spindle and vesicular pattern, they go in one line. And you can see here what looks, what will mimic maybe ebendimoma. And this is uh, one of the features of the tumor. These are the tumor cells arranged arrange themselves around blood vessels. Uh, in, uh, and these are the fibrillary cells are, uh, extending themselves into the uh, ebin, uh, blood vessels. This mimic ebendimoma, but they are not quite right for ebendimoma. But it comes in the differential when you look at them in the histology. Next slide. You can see there are some large cells, very large cells, but not really multinucleated giant cells. And there are some mitot mitotic figures. I think I put some of them here. But you can see the cells, they look like ganglion-like cells with many fibrillary background. Next slide. Um, again, here, more of the histology of the same thing with granular bodies. Uh, you can, this is, again, blood vessel that you can see uh, the cells are arranged around them uh, like uh, ebendimoma, but not quite right for ebendimoma. Uh, next slide. This is mitotic figure. Uh, it was actually not uncommon to see mitotic figure in this case. And I, I, I counted them about four, four mitotic figures per 10 high power feet, which is high for benign tumors. And when you see mitotic figures, uh, actually in the brain tumors become uh, very much alarmed. But when you get the right diagnosis, you can't, uh, because mitotic figures usually jump the tumor into grade four. And this was a dilemma. Usually when you see mitotic figures in grade one, you have to differentiate whether it's actually grade one or grade four, because it makes a lot of difference. And when you make a right diagnosis, you can see that mitotic figures can be seen in SEGA, and they are not really of importance. So this is very, the, the most important thing is to sort the diagnosis and to see what are the features that make it benign or malignant, uh, and not to be overcome by the usual uh, malignant features that we see in brain tumors. So mitotic figures in brain tumors usually is, is bad sign, but not in SEGA. SEGA doesn't really uh, carry as much importance. This again, you can see the ganglion-like cells, they look ugly actually. Uh, in the, when you see them the first time. Next slide. We can see areas uh, of hyalinization because of the uh, uh, chronicity and lipocytic changes. Next slide. Uh, again, you can see these are the lipocytic changes. They are hypocellular with hypercellular areas in, in, in this tumor. Next slide. Uh, we resort to uh, immunohistochemistry to confirm 
this rare diagnosis. This is non-specific enolase, uh, neuron, neuron specific enolase. You can see it stains some of the cells uh, because I wanted to be sure whether these are ganglion cells or not ganglions. But when they stand them, you see uh, ganglion cells stand are with NSE or neuron specific enolase. So we did another stain, which is uh, signed up to Fison, which was negative, we'll show you. This is Gimza stain. Gimza stain, I did it exactly in this tumor to see the mast cells. <laughs> Gimza stains highlight the mast cells. And this is when I suspected this tumor, I have to see mast cells. Mast cells usually are not easily seen by the usual H and E stain. So I have to resort to Gimza stain. And you can see a lot of mast cells. These are brown, are mast cells or dark, uh, dark uh, uh, magenta cells. And uh, this makes you probably with an add on feature of this is uh, one of the SEGA features in these tumors. Next slide. Uh, I did the JFAB. JFAB is a positive in uh, astrocytic, astrocytic origin tumors. And you can see they are actually multi focal batchy positive cells. So these cells are positive, most of them for. GFAB, and this is not usual for ganglion cells, but although the histology is, is, is more of ganglion. Next slide. I, I did it, but multiple H, uh, pictures of HF, uh, GFAB for astrocytic, and you can see it's multiple and fo multifocal. And in these areas, it's not staining, it's in, in these areas. Uh, and this is typical of this tumor. Next slide. Uh, this is sign up to fasting because NSE was positive. I have to do a, a confirmation test uh, the, uh, with a, whether these are ganglion cells or not ganglion cells, synaptophacin is completely negative in this tumor cells. So I know these are for sure, they are not ganglion cells. These are of astrocytic origin. Next slide. Uh, I this S100, it was positive in some of cells. And uh, this is usual with these tumors. Next slide. EMA, it can be positive in, uh, in, in dot-like shape, but it was negative in this tumor. Also, this is compatible with this tumor. Uh, we, do, we do usually key six, seven, and you remember we have mitosis, but when we do kiss up, usually it's one to two percent, and this was one percent uh, in this tumor, indicating that the perforation is really low. So this is all would come together that this is a benign tumor, WHO grade one, uh, subependymal Janssen astrocytoma. And uh, I pointed out uh, because this was not known to have uh, really uh, tuberous sclerosis, so I about in the comment, tuberous sclerosis should be considered in this patient. Mm -hmm. So again here, it just shows you that the immune staining, the markers that we have seen, is the essential part of the diagnosis. Uh, insurance companies would not like you to do that, because this is extra money, but you should insist on in doing them. And uh, should the neurosurgeon know the, these slides? Of course they should. In fact, they are part of the exam. In the American exam or the French exam, you would have slides of histology, what is this tumor? Because you should know. So post-operative course, here she is, lively and <coughs> functioning. Here we're looking at the eye movements, no parameter signs, mobilized, further recovery. We took the external um, shot. Yes, we kept it two, three days, make sure that there is no blood blocking and we remove it. So no shunts, basically. Immediate post-operative images, we have done a good job. We still have the calcification on the other side, which is there, but we left it. We are not interested in it. So many of these calcifications are there. And this is the SAR summary. The SAR summary, not one single piece of paper having two, three lines. Patient admitted, operation done, patient bye-bye. Uh, uh, this is what is written visually in the SAR summary. It should be like this telling everything about the patient and this course in hospital, the surgery, his images, recommendations, consultations, etc. And at that time, my resident was Dr. Mahmoud Nisa. Mahmoud Nisa is around, yes? Yes. Mahmoud Nisa is now a full-fledged neurosurgeon. Uh, this is the patient, again visiting me in my clinic after that. So she did very well. Yeah, now She has something in her lips. Uh, yes, part of uh, the adenoma situation. <coughs> she's 18 years, but she's been till the time she behaves like a boy of 8 or 10. Now, this is, uh, it will take you a few minutes, but this is the very interesting piece. This is a Jordanian family with the three sons affected by tuberous sclerosis. 
let me take you back to 1988. It is the year, one year before I got married. So who's the, who's the carrier? I will tell you. <laughs> but what I wanted to say that I remember 88 because this is one year before I got married. Usually you remember the year you got married with the fruit. Okay. This is the family. The elder brother, the middle brother, the younger brother. What happens? 88. This boy <coughs> had an arrest. Hadru Kifalus arrest. He was seen by pediatrician, Dr. Sabarawi, in Marka. He checked into hospital and then uh, forwarded him to me. Immediately we did a scan, we found the hydrocephalus, so we dealt with it. Uh, I saw him go through that. That's his CT88. He did not have MRI then. Look at this huge tumor, according to this huge hydrocephalus. I did not put a shunt. 88. The last shunt I put maybe one or two over the last 35 years. A good shunt is no shunt. Remove the cause and you're done. So we took him to theater, removed the tumor. Of course, he still has these subrependimentodules. I'm not interested in these, we're interested in this cedar, the tumor which caused construction. We did not put a shunt. That's my important point. And we did not give radiotherapy because I felt I removed the tumor completely. I will just watch these uh, tubercles and see how it goes. So, 88, following surgery, every year, almost every year, we had this. And these did not change. A little bit of changes, a little bit of tubercles. 2008. And beyond, of course. Up till, up till now, I'm following them. But I mean, radiologically. At that time, because I realized this is tuberous sclerosis, I said, bring the whole family. I got the father who had CT scan, which was normal. The mother had CT scan, she has tuberculosis. So the mother is the carrier of the disease. She transmitted that to her sons, three sons. And this is the elder brother. Sorry, it is on the other side. At that time, the CT scan was here is the right. And this is the middle, and this is the young. The young had tubercles, but no tumors. These two, they had their tumors on the left side, which is fine. <coughs> two sons, tuberous sclerosis, SIGA, and sand ventricle on the left side. So got the middle brother. He has a tumor causing hydrocephalus. So I operated upon him and followed him. For these years. Did you do any genetic workup on the Yes, I sent them for genetic counseling at the University of Jordan. Uh, this is the youngest brother. This is initial CT scan, and this is, uh, this is the, the same year, and this is 2008. No changes. I also followed the mother. She had more of these tubercles. You know, she's a carrier with tubercles, which increase in size, but no tumors. So that shows you not all patients with tuberous sclerosis would develop the SIGA. And this is the father who remained well. This is them as youngest. This is them as adults. It fills me with the pride to see that I followed these patients, operated upon them. I did not give them radiotherapy, it was unnecessary. And uh, it's, a, it's a source of joy for me. And we published this paper, because it's very rare to have this three sons or three members of the family with tuberous sclerosis having these tumors. It was published that it's one of the reference papers on the topic of uh, tuberous sclerosis. With this, I finish, and I thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Please. More than a question, really a comment. I think you have presented a very elegant presentation, like usually. Every Wednesday I come here, I land. When I don't come here, I lose many days of my life. Uh, just uh, because this is a pediatric uh, disease, mostly, uh, pediatrician, we should really look more into that, especially that now we're seeing more autistic patients. And it is reported that one third of 
patients with autism have uh, some kind of sclerosis. Another thing that these three kids, it was reported in April 49, two years after, one year after 14. So you remember, the, they were also in three kids and three boys that they had the retina. So congratulations, after 70 years, we, heard, we have heard of that. So we should really look as pediatricians when we do exam, mainly to the skin and really look into many organs and do the test and ask for family history and do what we do. Thank, Thank you very much. Any comments? Thank you for this uh, insight. We often see these cases, and, but we are lucky that it is rare because it's a very bad disease when you have one child of this mentally retarded, uh, seizure non stop. Even the family, one of the family, they stop treating with uh, one of their children. We don't want to be with that. And uh, what is peculiar about our Jordanian Palestinian kids? They have only neurological case. Uh, they, have, they don't have any uh, skin, which is 90% of the cases, because it is uh, at the age of eight years to have this baby to be arrested with hydrocephalus. And previously, there is no headache, no any signs of uh, intracranial pressure that is increased. It's uh, it's strange yeah. because of this and this for our pediatrician any yeah. headache if the patient complaint we have to take it very seriously absolutely yeah. any, our genetic is different no uh, these these patients that i showed the young girl the 18 year old girl uh, living in saudi arabia she had a denomination she was mentally retarded and she had, had seizures so you have the three components nobody just looked at it and that shows you uh, i remind you that a slowly growing tumor like this one, it can grow into huge size, mm -hmm. an orange size, without patient complaining. When tumors come like this, they say, oh, no, I have just complained of headache last week. And the tumor is there for 20 years because it is slowly growing. So any headache for three consecutive days or intermittently for two months deserves MRI, not CT. Go for the best. Go for the ultimate. Don't go for a CT half-heartedly. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, everybody is commenting on the pediatricians. They have to open their eyes and uh, think carefully on their patients. Uh, my question is: uh, Did you screen the uh, family of your patient? For, uh, the uh, Saudi uh, one? Yes, I yes. did. Yes, uh, I did. Yeah. But they refused to do it here. They did it in Saudi Arabia. And I don't know the result. Okay. But I asked them to 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 go for genetic counseling. And, uh, the and they were actually uh, uh, relatives, the father and the mother. And the other thing that uh, for us as pediatricians that we can do, if we have a family history, we can do antenatal diagnosis by uh, amniocentesis and Absolutely. chromosomal analysis. So uh, as we do. this disease can be treated uh, in, in utero. Yes, and uh, uh, what we can see as pediatricians is mainly the cutaneous changes that can lead us to think of the diagnosis. I have seen only one patient in my lab, and maybe 99, and then family saw so all the tumor kids, and then oh, but they we, just disappeared. If we miss one patient, that's too many. Yes, it is. Any other okay. questions or comments? Please, Dr. Mahmoud. The family, the mother of the kids had seizures? Uh, the family, Jordan family, yes. or the Saudi family? No, Jordan no. family, no. no. Uh, the, the three kids, they had epilepsy and mental retardation and adenomasipation. So the three kids had the three the traits. And the mother did not the have mother did not have anything, father was normal. Question here. Shukran Doctor Mahadra Qayyim Shukran. Uh I'm a radiologist. حبيت اركز على شغلتين، واحدة غير قابلة للنقاش اللي هي الهيستوري اوف ذا بيشنت لما المريض يروح على التصوير او على الراديولوجي يعني بيكون لو هذا المريض شفنا قديش في ديفرنشال دايجنوسيس لو انذكر في انه في عنده ابيليبسي او عنده سكين راشز او سكين ديزيز على طول بقول انا هذا تبرز تبرز اما اذا ما بنحكي الكلام هذا راح احط حالي في متاهه واحط الكلينيشن كمان في متاهه وجزء اخر ما افكر فيه تبرز الاستبروسس 
الشغل الثاني يعني It should be full. In London, if we could not write the full history and examination, the thing was refused. Write your findings. Write him Malaysia, the story, sudden, etc. Don't just write brain MRI. For what reason? What are you suspecting? Put them down. Yes. هلا احنا لما يجي عندنا مثلا مريض او يسال اجيت على البلد هون ثلاث سنين كنت في محل اكاديمي فما كانش في عندنا اي مشكله بانه اي طبيب يتكلم اي شيء لما يجينا لهون صارت في مشاكل تبدا انه انت ليش تتدخل في شغل سواء بيدياتريشن سواء جينيتولوجيست سواء اي واحد ثاني انت خلص انت اكتب شو الدياجنوستس ما تحكيش مع المريض ولا كلمه هذا الكلام طبعا كان مرفوض أه هلا هلا في يعني أه هل ممكن للطبيب هي في نقاش لازم يكون على المجتمع الطبي كله سواء النقابه سواء الوزاره سواء الكونفرنس زي هيك انه لما يكون احنا لما نشوف الغلط او اي طبيب يشوف غلط او شيء اجراء ممكن ينعمل له زي مثلا شنط يشوف تيومر وعامل اوبستراكشن لازم يشال التيومر هذا مشان يروح الاوبستراكشن في مريض بده يحط شنط، هل يحق للطبيب او من الافضل انه الطبيب يدل المريض ويقول له انك انت لا تعمل شنط؟ مش اذا عمل شنط تقول له انت يا دكتور عمل غلط، لا، هذا الكلام مرفوض، لكن هل ممكن انه يدل ولا لا؟ شكرا. اتمنى لو كان دكتور مؤمن حديدي موجود، بليز مسؤول عن هاي الشغله، بس ستريت فورورد اي وود سي يس. من رأى منكم منكرا فليغيره، إذا ضلنا كلنا ساكتين عن الإغلاط الشنيع، بنتكلم على التقدم، أنا بدي أحكي بالعربي مش هامل لأنه هو ترانسلتنج أبرود، بنتكلم عن التقدم الطبي الأردني، حقيقة في عنا تخلف طبي أردني. للأسف، ها؟ في ممارسات واضح إنها سيئة بس لا حسيبة ولا رقيبة، لا وزارة صحة ولا نقابة الطباء ولا أي جمعية تتدخل في المغالطات، الجرائم الطبية التي ترتكب. We have to admit that and we have to fight it. I think it should be written in the report. Sure. Yeah, but not verbally. Sure. This is my Yes, this is my conclusion. This is my first. I am entitled for my first. If we have if we have all gathered around the patient. What is the diagnosis? I would come with a diagnosis. You would come with a diagnosis. Another one would come. And we are entitled for our opinion. So we just say it. But to keep silent about the crimes that happens every minute of the day is, is, not, is not good. I could ask the doctor for that. Thank you very much. Do you think that the uh, seek happens only in the tuberculosis? Uh, and we have a normal population and which the person a very very little i think two three percent of cases can happen outside tuberous sclerosis so it is almost exclusively a tuberous sclerosis case but some cases have been reported in normal patients uh dr mahmoud al-asad he and he but i'm sure we'll be so well now في حاجه بالنسبه للشنط آه وهذه بتلاقي قابلنا كثير اللي هي سي اس اف بي هلا بعثنا لكم اياه كنيورو سيرجن قلتوا ما في سبب في البرين للهايبرتيشن احنا بنرقعه من الان ورد يرجع ثاني لانه في عنده بريشر واتس يور سوليوشن Uh, so I'm uh, talking about the treatment of increased intracranial pressure, benign increased intracranial pressure, right? Uh, one of the, can Dr. Ammar, can you help us here? What is the treatment of benign intracranial hypertension? Dr. Ammar, am I the neurologist? Depends if the patient can do early, probably go for uh, CSF uh, 
to just tap around 30 to 50 ml of CSF. And then, and usually we videotape the patient prior to the procedure and after the procedure and see any change in his gait, especially the apraxic or martial feet bar gait that usually uh, patient have. If there is improvement in the gait, this is an indication for shunting. If there is no improvement, there is no indication for shunting. Usually, uh, patients uh, comes too late to us, actually. And we do the LP, it's no improvement, so he's beyond any treatment. Otherwise, we don't have any other option except to diagnose him as early as possible so as to shunt him. Shunt here is a thecoperitoneal shunt from the lumbar theca, yeah. lumbar singular sac, to the peritoneum, and not a shunt. Uh, yes. أنا لما if there is Okay. Any other questions or comments? Dr. Salah Ajlouni, as a pediatric neurologist. No, I, I, I want to know whether you have any experience. I'm going to talk a little bit about the manifestations of the heart. We see skin manifestations, but sometimes it is late. And there are many people who are looking at the dermatologist so that they know and they don't know that this is so high index of suspicion is very important to highlight the general symptoms. Dr. do you see these cases from the pathology? Who else would like to comment? Dr. Rahim Sadat, Dr. Marad, do you see these hematomas? Okay, but as, as I said, it is FDA approval, so it's good. We use it since long time. Is it, is it useful? Yeah, it is. So it decreases the size, but it does not cause it to vanish. No, it doesn't. And it is long life uh, treatment. Is it expensive? Well, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> okay, any more questions or comments? Please, uh, some question here. I want to clear, you know, uh, the coffee uh, and lesion in the brain and increasing, uh, or increasing uh, uh, and day by day, or we, uh, month by month, should be uh, asocytone should be suspended. Absolutely. Okay, we'll, we'll finish. Uh, thank you. And next Wednesday, uh, we will uh, give you a presentation about uh, clivus cordons. Thank you. Okay, very good. This is Dr. John Bennett from Miami Beach, the studio of Neurosurgical TV. That was a presentation, a multidisciplinary presentation uh, by Dr. Ibrahim uh, Sabaya of Jordan, a uh, multidisciplinary approach to the uh, to, to tuberous sclerosis in three brothers in the Jordanian family. And we bid adieu. Thank you.